Thank you so much for coming to our last story hour of the season. I'm delighted this evening to welcome seven authors from our own campus community. You'll hear their names throughout the pre presentation. I have just a few things I'd like to mention. Silence your cell phones uh, or anything else that might make noise. If you'd like to sign up for our mailing list, please do that at the front desk. That'll be your best bet for getting the updates on authors for next year. Also, you can find us on Facebook. We're trying to build that up over the summer. So if you'd like to become a fan, we'd love to have you. And again, you might hear, hear about the upcoming authors sooner than everyone else. Um, finally, storyhour.berkeley.edu. We can find webcasts of this presentation as well as those from previous seasons, including Dave Eggers, Daniel Handler. You guys have entered that stratosphere now. So now I'll hand it over to Vikram Chandra, our faculty host. And we'll see you in September for next season of Story Hour. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so the various writers you'll uh, hear tonight are either um, winners of some of the prizes, the writing prizes that are given on campus, especially in the English department. And then some are um, the interns for Story Hour, to whom we are very grateful. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dana Ferenbarker. Did I say that right? Dana is an English and economics double major graduating in May. Next year, she'll be teaching English in Bulgaria on a Fulbright scholarship. She will hella miss her Berkeley writer friends. Um, this is about the day after Thanksgiving, and it's called, This is about the day after Thanksgiving. <laughs> if New Year's Day is the ultimate day for alcohol hangovers, then the day after Thanksgiving is the ultimate day for everything else hangovers. Presumably feeling the effects of the everything else hangover or trying to counteract the lack of sleep she got from waking up at 5 a.m. for the sales, my sister returned to the car with the 32 ounce cup of coffee from the Chevron station and p.m. She slammed, the, she slammed the van door shut, put on her sunglasses, and slouched down in her front shotgun seat. We waited in the car for a moment to return, disengaged from whatever our mother was doing, and solely aware of our personal senses of lethargy and doubt upon us by the day before. On no holiday apart from Thanksgiving do Americans seem to consistently overconsume in such a variety of substances. While on the 4th of July, one might, eat, ha, might have a bit too much cheesy Americana, and while on Easter, one might eat a bit too many peeps, things come in excess in a whole new way on Thanksgiving. Too many relatives, too much cooking, too much eating, too much football, too much traffic, too many expensive TV commercials, too many underage relatives who are too drunk, too many overage relatives that aren't drunk enough, too many televised performances of aging celebrities, too many televised performances of aging Disney stars, and too many ads in the newspaper, making retrieving the Walmart after Thanksgiving sale ad for your grandmother far too difficult. Why again were you going to the mountains today? My sister didn't ask me. My mom returned to the van with my dad and got in the driver's seat. My dad, at the window of the van, stopped talking about snow road conditions when he saw my sister's 32-ounce cup of coffee. Are you crazy? My dad reacted. Do you want to stay up all night? My dad, who only drinks one cup of coffee a day in the morning, epitomizes moderation, self-control, and, sharply contrasted by the theme of the day, an immunity to overindulgence. I was gonna share some, my sister defended herself. She took a gulp of the brown water flavored with artificial hazelnut. Besides, it was only 10 cents more for an extra large. It's only the afternoon, and she's young, George, my mom said. My dad left, and we pulled onto the freeway. My mom leaned over to my sister and continued her thoughts on the cup of coffee in a whisper. You're going to have to pee. <laughs> no, I won't. My sister quickly downed most of the coffee, gave the rest to me, and after expressing her disgusted disappointment over the crappy sale items she woke up at 5 a.m. for, turned over in the front passenger seat and fell asleep. There is a particular phenomenon that sets the day after Thanksgiving well above Thanksgiving Day itself as a unique and particularly admirable manifestation of American culture. Despite the excessive consumption on the previous day, an obtuse mass of Americans wake up exceptionally early the next day to engage in the ultimate act of national consumerism, the doorbuster deals, the early word specials, or the sales, as my extended family calls it. It's really quite an admirable cultural feat and bespeaks a work ethic I think my dad would warm to. Sure, pumpkin pie is festive, but it's only when you're in a 400-person line at Target and realize that everyone else had the same idea as you that you truly feel like you're partaking in a cult cultural tradition. Why is there so much traffic? My mom asked in complete seri seriousness. It's like, everyone get on the road, let's go to the mountains. Ugh, this is so slow. Dina, I'm just gonna close my eyes for a minute. Mom, you can't do that. 
She looked over at my sister sleeping. My mom had been up since 5 a.m. too. I can't do it while I'm driving, but if I'm stopped, I can go like this. She closed her eyes. No, mom, you can't do that. The car was undoubtedly still moving. My sister woke up. I have to pee, she said. Jules, we've stopped. Why don't you just get out and run over to the side, my mom said in complete seriousness. Hell no, I'm not tramping through the snow in my tights. Her snow apparel also consisted of cut-off shorts and a short-sleeved t-shirt with Connie West's face on it. No more giant cups of coffee, my mom said. Well, let's put on some Christmas music to distract. The CD my mom put in began playing Ave Maria, which, in my mind, is much more associated with funerals than with Christmas. And with a pace of pallbearers, our van continued to climb up the steadily icier road with the rest of the traffic. My sister pulled on Connie's face and moaned, I can only hold it five more minutes. My mom held up the empty coffee cup in front of my sister. We won't tell anyone, she whispered in complete seriousness. I'll fill it up. It's too small. <laughs> you will not fill it up. Yes, I will. No, you won't. Yes, I will. <laughs> and um, I'm introducing Faith. Faith is a senior at UC Berkeley, double majoring in English in interdisciplinary studies in English with a minor in creative writing. Outside of school, she works for the liberal blog Daily Coast, Coast tutors Oakland high school students, and plays in a band called Hooray for Everything. I'm going to be reading a shortened version of a short story called Pizza Guy. A wise man working at a pizzeria in downtown LA once told me that true intelligence is being able to entertain all ideas without necessarily believing them. We happened to be discussing a certain conspiracy theory involving shape-shifting lizards from outer space that had bred with ancient Sumerians and whose descendants now feasted on human blood to survive. I was enthralled with the idea that there were reptiles from another dimension controlling the planet Earth. I didn't necessarily believe it was true, but I was likely to discuss it with practically anyone. I was new to LA and socially awkward. I didn't have friends per se, but I did have a lot of strange conversations with people like Mike. Mike was the wise man working at the pizzeria. Every time I came into the pizzeria, Mike's staple question was, what book you reading? And it turned out he had always read the book I was carrying with me. He started giving me discounts on my pan pizzas, which I assumed meant we were now friends of some sort. I came in twice a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays. When I was finished eating, he'd smoke a cigarette with me out in the steamy parking lot. After the first couple of weeks, we transcended specific books and began discussing the idea of learning and wisdom in general. Out in the parking lot, everything smelled like a mixture of pizza sauce and gasoline. These semi-weekly conversations lasted only five minutes or so at a time, and passersby often stared at the lanky young guy in the bright blue and red pizza uniform, gesturing maniacally to support some thesis on learning, cigarettes zigzagging in the air. Yes, yes, man, it's like the more you learn, the more you know you don't know, you know? Like Socrates said, I must be the wisest man because whereas others don't know they don't know anything, I know I don't know anything. So that's it, man, all these people ordering pizzas and getting all pissed off because gas prices are high and arguing about the president or God or whatever, they have no idea, man, because they think they have an idea. He looked at his plastic watch and stamped his cigarette out on the pavement. Later, dude. He went back, into the, uh, back to his pizza oven, and I returned to my broiling Oldsmobile. Once I asked him how he could be content working a brainless job for the rest of his life if he was so interested in these deep things, he laughed as if to say, stupid old man, what do you know? The rest of my life? Hell no. What, you want to stand here in the middle of a parking lot for the rest of your life? Are you crazy? Nothing is forever. I'm writing a book from my experience here, man, and then I'm going to do something else. Nothing is forever. Don't you know that? Nah, man, I'm writing a brilliant novel and shit. Can I read it? Well... He glanced at his watch and crushed out his cigarette. It's only a first draft. I never even told anyone about it before now. It's not ready. I didn't mean to intrude. If it's not ready, it's not ready. All right, OK, OK, I'll let you read it. But, but man, you can't tell anyone about it. My friends would really give me shit. I'd never met any of his friends, but I promised. It was a Thursday when Mike told me about his novel, which meant I wouldn't see him again until Tuesday. It was impossible to stop imagining what information this mysterious manuscript would contain. His manner of speaking implied that he couldn't compose anything beautiful or eloquent, but Mike had read everything from the Iliad, those dudes love war and stuff, to Walden and other writings. Walden seems like a cool place. It'd be cool to go there someday after I see Vegas. <laughs> He read more than any human being I'd ever known, and from what I've heard, the more you read, the better you write. I spent the next four days in anticipation of Mike's novel. The more I thought about it, the more I decided I might be the first person to read what would become the most important book published in my lifetime. 
On Tuesday, after I finished eating my pan pizza, Mike met me out in the parking lot. We lit up cigarettes. He handed me a manuscript about 250 pages long. He laughed nervously and told me to take good care of it. It was his only copy. I assured him I would read it right away and bring it back on Thursday in perfect condition. We shook hands for the first time. I drove home mechanically, my nerves tingling in anticipation. I got to my apartment, turned up the air conditioner, fluffed my pillows, and sat on the sofa with the manuscript in front of me. I stretched my legs and arms and breathed deeply before taking the manuscript out of its envelope. The title read, Pizza Guy, P-I-Z-A-G-Y. <laughs> this provoked a little frown. I turned the page and began to peruse. As I flipped through the pages, my frown deepened and deepened. Mike's novel was the worst attempt at writing I had ever seen. The entire novel was one long sentence. Practically every word was misspelled. Mike apparently did not know how to conjugate simple verbs either. I pushed the manuscript away and fell into deep contemplation. When I came back on Thursday, Mike wanted to discuss the manuscript in depth. All I could say was, it needs a lot of revision. But the story was good, right? That's what matters, the story? Sure, sure, the story was good. I'm not good at reading, man. Mostly I just listen to books on tape. I get them from the library, it's free. Crack open a beer, put the TV on mute and space out. Reading's too hard for me. We shook hands in the parking lot for the last time. I advised him to find a good editor. I didn't tell him I was going back to New York in three days, that my business on the West Coast was finished. He said he would see me Tuesday, and I nodded. On the plane ride home, I was stuck between a fat German tourist and a blonde woman whose face had been surgically stretched into an eerie permanent smile. I thought about the conversation I'd had with Mike about Socrates. There are some people who know they don't know anything, and some who don't know they don't know anything. As the plane took off and my stomach lurched, I decided I was probably the latter. But at least I knew it. <laughs> <clears throat> And um, I'm introducing David Krolikowski. David is a fourth year student majoring in Japanese and minoring in Korean. Hello, um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt of a story called A Faraway Place. In the purple light of the night, the staircase looked like a black spider's web. Every step Dave took echoed against the cold stone floor now hidden by the spiral of the metal stairs. As they swayed just slightly in the wind, the tips of the thin trees, green with layers of black, looked like long hands pointing up into the sky outside the window. His fingers damp with sweat, Deu collected the contents of his small office and placed them into a cardboard box. He had always believed in packing lightly, and by the time he was finished, the box was only about half full, its contents mostly clean stacks of paper. The walls of his office were completely empty, and in the dark, this blankness felt eerie, like the white of a giant eye filled with tears. He put his head to this wall and felt its coldness above his brow. The air conditioner clicked off. Deyu had not expected the end to feel like this. The corridors were empty. The building was asleep. Two floors above him, a security guard paced the hallways. Even now, he felt like he was being watched, maybe by the camera next to the elevator. For the last 10 years, those doors had opened for him every morning to reveal a chorus of voices people running back and forth in business suits and skirts. When he entered, they would all stop and greet him with a smile, most with a low bow. He could not stand to see their faces now, their eyes, the one question. Today, the entire world was watching him. At that moment, his phone began to ring. Instinctively, he reached into his pocket to silence it, but then he pulled it out again to see who was calling. It was his wife. He laid the phone down on the empty desk and let it buzz away like a dying insect. After 20 seconds, his wife's picture faded into the darkness of the room, and everything was quiet again. Deyu had met her in his last year at the university. A friend had arranged a meeting for them, and they immediately took a liking to each other. After just one week, they were already sharing long phone calls into the night, and soon enough, during an afternoon walk in the park, Deyu asked her to marry him. He was sure that she would agree. Already, he was receiving good job prospects, and he could tell that their relationship was developing into something special. When she turned away and quietly retreated to a nearby bench to cry, he did not know what to feel. He just sat there in silence with her for a few minutes, and then they walked back together just as it was about to get dark. She told him she would marry him the next week in the crowded coffee shop, and until many years later, when there was nothing left to say, they never discussed the day of his first proposal. Sitting on that bench, Deyu had felt his first unmistakable pang of loneliness. Sometimes, when the work was busy and the days were long, he would wake up in the night with that feeling in his spine. It felt like the rain running down a long glass window. Uh, 
Um, I'm introducing the next writer, who's Kim Oya. Kim started college in 1987, took 20 years off for a career in film and television, and is pleased as punch to be graduating this spring. For her second act, she would like to be a writer. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a piece I wrote um, earlier in the semester, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph, and then a, I'm going to go about 10 pages in and read a few paragraphs there. It's called Little House in the City. There's a neighborhood on the west side of Los Angeles where the super wealthy live right alongside the near homeless, a place where the famous and the infamous pick up their morning newspapers and wave to their wholly anonymous neighbors. Tiny two-bedroom cottages whose owners haven't so much as updated the carpet since 1942 stand in the shadows of mansions, villas, two- and three-lot-wide manor homes. Hoarders live across the street from people who can't tolerate a leaf lying on the lawn. The most famous philater on earth lives there. OJ killed Nicole and Ron there, and in the middle of it all stands a tiny white bungalow in which I lived for a time while I gradually lost my mind. Over time, Ray, that's uh, my husband at the time, over time, Ray and I met all of our neighbors. Some of them came over to chat while we were working in the front garden, or I was reglazing a window. Others were drawn to the canine adoption facility I was running out of the backyard. The neighbors to the right, who came darn close to taking two malnourished chihuahuas I was treating for mange, were known to us as the Preciouses. Neither Ray nor I have any recollection of their real names because all we ever heard for four years was some version of the following. Precious? Yes, Precious. Precious, where are you? I'm in the backyard, Precious. Why? Oh, there you are, Precious. Precious, I'm going to the store. Do you need anything? No, I can't think of anything, Precious. Precious, drive safely. Luckily for Ray and me and our love of merciless ridicule, the homes in our neighborhood were packed pretty tightly. The lots there were super long but narrow, so the Precious's driveway was exactly three feet from every open window on the north wall of our house. We could hear their preciosity day and night, whether they were indoors or out. Precious he and precious she were a source of never-ending fun for us. Here we are lying in bed one morning after just having listened to their later, latest conversation of preciousness. Specious? What, Precocious? Is it preshing? I'm a little busy. I have precious little time to apply my Lee Preshon nails before the Presh conference. Well, Luscious, I was just recalling precious memories about a bodacious child who had precious few friends until, presto, he became gracious. He really made an impression on you, Delicious. And on and on. The Preciouses were young, maybe as late as... Uh, maybe as young as late 20s. They lived in a million-dollar home, had a gardener and a housekeeper, but they each drove an old beat-up car as if they were starving college students. Precious he used to start up his oxidized brown 1982 Corolla every morning and gum the engine for minutes at a time before he finally put the thing in reverse and backed down the driveway. By that time, our house was filled with the white smoke from his tailpipe. If Ray or I ever get a lung polyp, we know who to blame. Once or twice a month, a glittering black Lamborghini pulled into the Precious' driveway, and an older couple got out and disappeared into the house. Ray and I made up a story that the Precious' were being funded by Mummy and Duddy, our names for the people who got out of the Lambo. We imagined that Mummy and Duddy used to call one another precious, but that after so many years of marriage, she referred to him as unconscious, and he called her suspicious. <laughs> the preciouses did not like darkness. At night, their house was a big ball of luminescence, and the exterior spotlights were so glaring that our bedroom was lit up like Dodger Stadium. I bought blackout shades for all our windows so we could sleep. Ray and I finally decided it was Precious She who was afraid of the dark, because when she was away, Precious He turned off the lights at bedtime like a normal person. <laughs> Catty-cornered from the Precious's house was the Lewinsky spread. I remember the first time I saw Monica outside. Ray and I were returning from a Sunday morning walk with our dog to Noah's Bagels up on San Vicente. I had in my hand a paper bag containing three everythings and three cinnamon raisins. Ray had in his hand the leash with our dog at the end of it. Suddenly, there she was, 
crossing our path, carrying an armload of purses. Monica stepped onto the sidewalk and smiled broadly at Ray. Didn't seem to notice me at all. <laughs> I took advantage of my invisibility to scrutinize her. I looked her up and down, back and forth, round and round, just as I imagine every other woman in America does when she finds herself face to face with Monica Lewinsky, especially if Monica Lewinsky is in the process of Cheshire catting the husband of said woman. So, you're the one who went down on the president, I said to her telepathically as I narrowed my eyes and cocked my head. I remember thinking how notably young and fresh-faced and chubby she was. Wow, that was her, Ray said, once we were out of earshot. <laughs> she doesn't look like an executive branch kind of cocksucker to me, I sniffed. <laughs> uh, I am introducing the great Lisa Santanello. Lisa's a graduating senior in the English department with a minor in creative writing, originally from LA. The Julia Keith Shrout Short Story Prize is her first fiction prize. Hello, I'm Lisa. Um, this is a passage from a short story I wrote last semester. Um, it follows a man as he visits his ex-wife at the house they shared, and he um, tries to make amends. After what feels like a long time, LD looks at me and opens her mouth. Look, I don't really want to talk about all that. I'm trying to get on with my life, Ray, not go back to it. I try to say something, but she quiets me with her hand. I just want to finish making dinner, she says. She continues to set the table, placing one plate down and then another across from it, dealing the dishes from the stack of plates and bowls between her arms and onto the table. I watch her body shift underneath her dress as she moves around the kitchen and dining room. Her hips and thighs pull at the thin purple fabric of her dress as she leans over the table, and I can see the faint outline of her underwear. The way she moves seems heavier and more certain, like there's no hesitation in her motions. You look good, Eldie. I'm glad, I say. She laughs a sharp, sarcastic laugh. My sister says I've looked like I've lived two lives by now. I can tell she's looking at me, and I feel a sudden rush of shame about my own appearance. My thinning hair suddenly feels much thinner than before, and I imagine my stomach pressing hard into my shirt buttons and reaching far out over my belt buckle. Desperate to shrug the attention off of myself, I look around the house. I can tell she's changed things, but not as much as I worried she would have by now. My chair is gone, probably one of the first things to go after I left. By the end of it, I was practically living in the damn thing. The rack where I used to throw my coat by the door is gone too. I know why she's gotten rid of these things, but it stings a little to see the empty places where they once were. I can feel her still looking at me. She tucks the corners of her mouth underneath her cheeks into a small, sad frown. I'm going to redo the whole place, she says, as she brushes her bangs out of her eyes with the palm of her hand, just as soon as I get some time. Two years sure doesn't feel like a long time, I say. Almost everything else looks exactly the same as it did the day I left. My books are still scattered amidst her other books on the bookcase. I half expect to find the last book I was reading lying on the side table, open to the very page that I left it. From outside, the gravel road crackles and pops. Look, I think I heard a car pull up, she says. And besides, I don't think there's much you could say that I'd want to hear. I look out the dining room window and see an old gray Volkswagen round the corner and keep driving along the main road. I'm trying to make it up to you for leaving, Aldi. I know I left a lot of things not right. I don't want there to be a big hole where I used to be. Eldie looks at me with a look of sad compassion or pity, I'm not sure which. I feel embarrassed for saying that to her. She finally opens her mouth and says, there are holes that are just empty holes and there are holes that have to be filled with something better, Ray. I look away from her and stare at the steaming food displayed on their dishes. I yank the chair out from the small square dining table, its arms scrape loudly against the underside of it. I try to think of every meal I've ever eaten at this table. I remember the first dinner we ever ate on it, the day after we moved in. We had to get takeout because the gas hadn't yet been turned on. We used the fancy dishes we got from our wedding. I remember when Eldie made my mother's recipe for meatloaf and I nearly cried because it tasted exactly how I remembered it tasting as a child. I remember meeting Eldie's grandmother who came, for, came up from Virginia to stay with us for the holidays. I got sent out to get a tree and came back drunk, late for dinner and treeless. I saw Eldie's grandmother grab Eldie by the elbow and pull her into the kitchen. 
I heard her say to Eldie, I just don't think he's good people. Just remembering gives me a sickening, bitter feeling in my stomach, and I wonder if Eldie remembers all of this too, every time she sits down at the table. I remember meal after meal, me in my seat and Eldie in hers. What are you doing, Eldie says. Her bright blue eyes shine under the kitchen light. I'm just taking my seat at the table, I say, calmly. I grab my fork and knife in my palms. You don't live here anymore, Ray. You have no right doing what you're doing. Do you hear me? Say something, Ray. Her voice gets higher with each word, peaking with my name. But I don't say a thing. I grab the silver bowl with the flowers embossed around the lip and begin serving some broccoli onto my plate. I reach past the water pitcher to grab a piece of bread and then grab two. I look at the beef on the table, its juice still draining into the grooves of the cutting board. The strings wrapped around the meat look plump and dirty, like they're holding the beef so tightly it could burst. I feel my ribs wrap around the muscly thing in my chest and suck in a sharp breath. It's my pleasure to introduce Angeline Smith. Angeline is a recent graduate, graduate who majored in both English and American studies. She was the 2009 and 2010 recipient of the Elizabeth Mill Crothers Prize in Literary Composition, the 2009 recipient of both the Judith Lee Stronach Prize for Poetry and the Judith Lee Stronach Prize for Prose, and the 2010 recipient for the Julia Keith Shrout Short Story Prize. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading from a story called Ink, and it takes a little bit of background to understand what's going on. So it actually takes place in a tattoo shop, and the main character is named Roma, and she's a very complex person. She uh, has gotten stoned and recently, just before this happened, uh, messed up somebody's tattoo. They came in looking for a repair job, and she... Uh, Badly messed it up. So the customer trashed the shop, and now she's left in the shop with the shop lackey, who's named Dan, and the owner, who's named Haim. And he is a quiet, good man who uh, she kind of regards as being under her thumb, and she has a casual sexual relationship with him. So the, the guy who just trashed, trashed the shop has just left. They stood without moving. He left his shirt, Dan said weakly. Both Haim and Roma looked over. Well, I don't know. What the fuck am I supposed to say right now? Nothing, Haim said, shaking his head. Nothing. We just help Roma clean up. Nah, man, that's all. Suddenly, Roma was furious. No way, she said. Fucking Dan told him to look in the mirror. Dan's the asshole who told him to check out his back. Cleaning fucking up is what Dan's here to do. He gets to do it. Haim frowned. Jesus, stop it, Roma. Whatever, Haim, you fucking know best, don't you? You would never have messed up his tattoo. Just ask fucking Dan. She picked up one of the busted bottles and whipped it hard at Dan, who ducked. He stayed close to the ground in a crouch, looking at Haim. Hey, Dan, Haim went over to him, held out his hand to pull him up. We're done for the day, okay? Roma will clean this up. You can go home if you want, and I can come over in the morning. Take a look at the rest of your designs, okay? Dan took his hand, stood up. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Haim. I'll see you tomorrow. He grabbed his binder of drawings and walked a wide swath around Roma to the door. Okay, bye. I'll see you, Roma, he added, and then left. The door chimed behind him. Haim turned toward Roma. He said, I'm going to make a couple phone calls. I want to see if I can take care of this before it becomes a big deal. And I'm going to run over to Finnegan's, see which bartender that guy knows. Maybe I can call in some favors, do my best to make sure he doesn't try anything with you. He walked over to the door. You're going to need to lock it behind me, though, he said, and left. Romo locked the door, then looked around. Fuck, she said, surveying the ink all over the walls and the floor. She got some of the industrial cleaner from Dan's cleaning closet and a roll of paper towels, and surprisingly, the ink came off the walls and floor pretty easily. Her collages were ruined, though, and she rolled them up and stuck them in the trash can. She picked up the broom and got to work on the broken condenser tubes and the shards of plastic. When she was finished sweeping, she pulled some of Haim's stuff out from the corner he had pushed them into. There was more there than she had realized, books and books of designs, trade magazines with little tabbed stickers marking the pages, tidy binders of invoices. She thought it wouldn't hurt her to give him some more space, and she pulled the rest of the stuff out. Roma arranged the design books in a row, pushing hers closer together to make room. When she was done, she pulled out Dan's chair so he wouldn't be so crowded in next to Haim. She heard the door rattle and looked up, saw him. Hey, she said, letting out the deep breath she'd been holding since he had been gone. How'd it go? 
It went okay, I think. I talked to Jesse, the bouncer over at Finnegan's. He's a friend of the guy's. Said he can be rough, but Jesse said he'd talk to him. He thinks the guy will be okay once he cools off. I also talked to Mike over at Everlasting and Greg and Ramon at Hollywood and what's his name at Body Art. Let them know if he came in needing work that I'd take care of the cost. I think it'll probably be fine. We'll see, I guess. Thanks for doing that, Haim. I appreciate it. I'm sorry about this. It's cool, Roma. You fucked up. He was mad. What are you gonna do? Roma shrugged. Well, I think I got everything as clean as it's gonna get. Nothing got on your books. After all Dan's shit, it turned out to be a good thing that I like to hog the space. Your stuff was kind of hidden back there in the corner. She tried out a small smile. Haim gave her a half-hearted smile back. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess you could see it that way. Or not, I guess, she said. Or not, he agreed. So, Haim? Roma picked up her jacket and leaned against the back of her chair. Yeah, what's up? What are you thinking about doing right now? How do you mean, Haim said. I'd like to get a drink or something if you're up for it, Roma said. Oh, huh. I don't know. I'd like to hang out tonight if that's cool. Haim looked at her hard. You shouldn't have blamed Dan. You shouldn't have done that to him. That wasn't cool, he said, finally. Yeah, well, he should have paid better attention to rule number six, Roma said with some of her usual bravado. Haim stared at her, his eyes crinkled, his face grim, and Roma looked down. Well, will you, she said, come out with me tonight? You know, he said, I don't think so. I don't think I'm that interested in drinks, you know? Okay, Roma said, and she looked at Haim, and she did know. It's my pleasure today to introduce Natalie Sang. Natalie is a senior English and history major. She's originally from Orange County. She received the Elizabeth Mills Crothers Prize in Literary Composition. Thank you, Angeline. So I'm gonna read an excerpt of a longer piece that I'm currently working on. Okay. And it doesn't have a title yet, so. And it's also a fantasy piece. Eeyore had been feeling jittery for quite some time and knew that he would be better when she came home. Nestled against her, listen, listening to her soft breathing and slow heartbeat, put him into a lull, the closest he ever came to sleeping or dreaming. He could not walk inside of her dreams anymore, but he felt warm when she was close and content, toasty. It would ease the strangeness that bubbled inside him, which was exasperated by the voices in the trees. There are things like him, but not like him outside. Their language and their purpose were, were different, but Eeyore shared enough, of, enough with them to get the general gist of their conversations. Fear, mor morbid fascination, and anticipation. He had gotten into the habit of wandering around on still nights, and even though the leaves beat out an invitation on the window, he could not imagine what would drive him outside tonight. Instead, he turned back to his book. It was an old paperback of Herodotus's histories with her initials TM scrawled on the cover page. His eyesight was very good and he was able to read by moonlight and starlight. He liked to read her textbooks because, of, because the hard covers and pictures reminded him of the picture books they used to read together and the times they squabbled over the pronunciation of certain words. By the time she had started reading novels, he had begun to wear away at the edges and blur, so he didn't like them as much. Resentment and jealousy did not come naturally to imaginary friends. As a whole, they came and went, obliging, understanding, and kind. Eeyore knew what was expected of him, but he couldn't help feel, he couldn't help feel sad and angry and confused. It had happened suddenly. One day she was 11 years old, and when her mother asked her about Eeyore, she said he had left, and so he did. The next thing he knew, she was 21, and there had not been the slightest feeling for him that any time had passed. She had changed. Her hair was the same, so was her nose, but her braces were gone, and she lined her eyes in black. He did not understand her anymore. Her mind was a, was a strange whirl of colors, sounds, and smelled of, faintly of burning rubber. And he, once a tall, suited man shaped the color and texture of blue, Jean Lint was now smoky, insubstantial from non-belief. He was hungry and lethargic most of the time. Lethargic was a word she used a lot. He spent his days scrounging for pieces of lint, which, which tasted like black currant candies, and cigarette butts, which tasted like s'mores. It was a far cry from the tea parties they used to have. 
She had a tea set that changed from white to pink with the application of hot water. They feasted on strawberry flavored cream cheese, on triangles of Wonder Bread, cheeseburgers and frosted glasses of lemonade with just a hint of Lipton's tea. When do you think she'll be home, he asked Suki, the stuffed pig, and Apis the bull. He was still not used to how old and worn they looked. They had been able to talk too once, but they sat mute on her bed, their blank beady eyes aimed towards the door. He batted them subtly, suddenly and sent them crashing and rolling on the floor. Of course they did not react. Anger was unseemly in an imaginary friend, but he was hungry. Eating dust gave him enough of a shape, something in between a spider shadow puppet and a crab-shaped cloud, so he could turn the tissues and pages of her textbooks. Sometimes he wished he could fade out. Other times he watched the squirrels chatter and run up and down the tree next to her window. He watched the gray rain drum against the window and to the view of the tree, the house next door and the black road was the swirly whirly mess. He liked the smell of coffee. He still liked her, of course, but the fact that he liked so many other things besides her, outside of her, that was problematic too. The front door opened and slammed against the wall. He could, he could hear her stumbling, a heavier set of footsteps behind her. She had been drinking. It made him feel sick. Ear didn't want to call her cruel, but all too often the shapes of her thoughts were sharp, brittle, and odorless, like spun sugar. Her motions ran up and down the up and down the threads, round and round, a bright colorful blur of lights that hissed and steamed. He was right next to her. He was worth 10 of those boys she brought over, a hundred. She was too old for him. He didn't belong here, but that strange hollowness had yanked him here. If he didn't know any better, he would think that he was being mocked or punished. When the bedroom door opened, he slipped past her and the man she had brought home. The hinges of the tiny male slot squeaked in a beckon. There was nothing left for him here, he reminded himself, and squeezed through the opening and into the night. <laughs> so on behalf of Story Hour, I'd like to thank Vikram Chandra and Melanie Abrams for sponsoring this series and bringing so many wonderful authors to UC Berkeley this year. Um, Here's a small gift of gratitude from all of us on the Story Hour team. Okay, that wraps up another wonderful season of Story Hour. Thank you all for being part of it, especially to our authors today. Um, Gosh, I wish I could remember everyone's name. Let's see if I can do it. Dina Fernbacher, thank you. Lisa Santaniello, David... Frolisowski, <laughs> my apologies, um, Angeline Smith, Faith Gardner, Kim O. Ya, and Natalie Sang, one of our wonderful Story Hour volunteers. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in September.